Hello marine biology students. In this video, we're going to talk about cnidarians and tenophores. So phylum cnidaria. This is one of those strange Latin words with a silent C, but we'll see that also will be true for our next phylum, phylum tenophore. So phylum cnidaria. Some of the basic characteristics of cnidarians is that they have radial symmetry. Most species of cnidarians are marine, but there are a few freshwater hydroids. There are two basic body plans when it comes to cnidaria, those of the free-swimming medusa or of the attached polyps. They have the same basic body plan, they're just oriented slightly differently. Regardless of whether we're talking about a medusa or a polyp, there's a single opening that serves both as the mouth and the anus, and there are two layers of tissue, the epidermis and the gastrodermis. Separated between them can be a gelatinous layer known as the mesoglea. So when we look at these two tissue layers, the epidermis, covers the body's surfaces, whereas the gastrodermis lines the internal cavity. We see a distinction here from the sponges, which lacked any sort of tissue structure or organization. The mesoglea is an acellular gelatinous matrix between these two types of tissues and this makes up the jelly part of a jellyfish. One key feature that cnidarians have are these harpoon-like structures known as nematocysts, and they're found within a particular type of cell known as a cnidocyte. So nematocysts are these coiled harpoon-like structures that usually have a trigger and when that trigger is pressed, it will discharge the harpoon. The cells that hold these nematocysts are called cnidocytes. Instead of having a complete digestive system or a digestive tube, cnidarians have a gastrovascular cavity. And this gastrovascular cavity ends up having a single opening that functions both as a mouth and an anus. Now these cnidarians don't quite have taste buds like we do, so it's not as disturbing a concept for them as it would be for us. There's no centralized nervous system, but there is a nerve net throughout the body of the cnidarian to coordinate its movements. Some jellyfish also have additional sensory cells. and contractile cells, which allow it to receive information from its environments and respond accordingly. When we look at reproduction in these cnidarians, they can reproduce both sexually and asexually. With sexual reproduction, there can be different patterns. In some cnidarians, the medusa is the sexual stage, releasing eggs and sperm. Fertilized eggs result in a zygote, which then develop into a swimming larva, which is known as the planula. This planula then settles on the bottom to form a colony of polyps. New medusa will then be formed by this mature colony. So here we can see a model of this lifestyle, with the medusa forming the gametes, the gamete then forming an embryo, then to a planula larva. That planula larva settles on the bottom and undergoes metamorphosis into a colony, and that colony would reproduce through asexual means until eventually they form reproductive medusa again. This is the life cycle of one type of cnidarian known as a hydrozoan. Cnidarians are also capable of asexual reproduction. 
This could end up being through the polyps themselves that can reproduce by budding. And we can also see that some polyps can reproduce by fission. And again, the difference between fission and budding. Budding is when a smaller individual starts growing off the body of a larger one, but fission is when a large adult simply breaks or divides into two equally sized individuals. So let's talk about the different types of cnidarians. So the first class of cnidarians we want to talk about are the hydrozoans. They generally consist of colony of polyps with small reproductive medusa. So these include some of the freshwater cnidarians, as long as many of the marine cnidarians. There's a specific group within the hydrozoans known as the siphonophores. And siphonophores are interesting in that they're a drifting colony of polyps. Now these colonies are atypical in that some of them are specialized for different tasks. One example of a siphonophore is the Portuguese man-o-war from the genus Physalia. In this case, the siphonophore colony has a gas-filled float, so this is a surface-floating siphonophore. Many siphonophores are going to be found in deep water, but not the Portuguese man-o-war. With this colony, some of the polyps have long tentacles filled with stinging nematocysts. And here, when we look at this, these diagrams of these siphonophores or hydrozoans, we see this feathery-like colony of polyps. And then we also see the Portuguese man-o-war with its entangling nematocyst-filled tentacles that allow it to prey on fish and other organisms in the water. Both of these types of cnidarians could have nematocysts that could puncture human skin. And so you might notice a, a burning or stinging sensation if you're in contact with either of these. The next class of cnidarians are the Scyphozoans. This is the class with the large marine jellyfish. They are very large medusa. And the polyp stage of a Scyphozoan's life is usually very limited and the polyps themselves are very small. The medusa stage is definitely the dominant life cycle for the Scyphozoans. They move by rhythmic muscular contraction of the bell. Yet even though they generate the swimming motion, they are carried by water currents, so they are considered to be macroplankton. The next group of cnidarians are the cubomedusae. They look like Scyphozoans, but they're typically significantly smaller, and it turns out they're usually also far more dangerous to humans. The Cuba Medusa have some of the most powerful stings and could potentially be fatal either from the toxin that they release or by causing a swimmer to faint or pass out or be unable to swim and therefore drown. So these are usually small medusa with tentacles armed with very powerful nematocysts. These are often so small that they can be difficult to see in the seawater, which makes them all the more dangerous. The last type of cnidarian that I want to talk about are the anthozoans from class Anthozoa. These are going to include corals, sea anemones, and gorgonians, or sea fans, which we see pictured here. These can be single, such as some of the sea anemones we saw earlier, or colonial, as is the case with corals and gorgonians. They have colonial polyps, and typically, anthozoans do not have a medusa stage. Corals can secrete calcium carbonate skeletons and build complex coral reefs.
Now, not all corals are reef-building corals. In fact, there are soft corals as well. And a coral will not build a reef in every environment. But in environments that promote the growth of these corals over many generations and long periods of time, they can become a dominant structure in the marine environment. Most corals have symbiotic zooxanthellae. And these symbiotic dinoflagellates are able to provide the corals with the benefits of photosynthesis, while the coral polyps provide protection to the zooxanthellae. This completes our discussion of the cnidarians. The next phylum I'd like to talk about are the tenophores. So phylum tenophora. These are the comb jellies. Now there are ways that they look similar to jellyfish. They are primarily translucent and gelatinous, but there are differences as well. Comb jellies have eight rows of ciliary combs that beat continuously. And the way that these cilia refract light ends up causing very beautiful rainbow-like patterns to be seen along the edges of these tenophores. Like the cnidarians, the tenophores have radial symmetry. However, unlike the cnidarians, tenophores do not have nematocysts or stinging cells. Instead, these tenophores have adhesive sticky cells called coloblasts. And these coloblasts on their tentacles allow them to ensnare things like fish larvae and zooplankton, which they would then feed on. There are about 100 species, all of which are marine, and most of them are planktonic. So that takes us to the end of our discussion of tenophores and cnidarians. Now before the next video, I would like you to think about how many different types of worms are you familiar with? We'll probably introduce you to a few new ones in the next video. See you then.